Next, we have a 45 minute session on ROP, a biomarker for brain development by Professor Anne Hellstrom, Professor in Pediatric Ophthalmology, Sweden, who will be joining us online. We humbly invite Dr. Rahul Yadav, a consultant neonatologist at Rainbow Children Hospital, Chennai, to chair this session and request you to introduce the speaker. Good evening. It's my great pleasure to welcome you, Madam. Professor N. Hellstrom. She is Professor in Pediatric Ophthalmology, Sargrenska Academy, University of Gothenburg, Sweden. She's board member of Swedish National Register for Retinopathy of Prematurity, Sweet Drop, 2006, and, and is ongoing. So I welcome you for the session, Madam. So the, the topic is quite interesting here. Here the topic is actually about uh, the surrogate marker, the development of brain and retina. Are they parallel? Because all, all of us, we know that. Welcome me, madam. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, madam. Okay, and can you see my images? Yes, madam. Is this better? Do you see the full page now? Yes, yes, madam. Please go oh. ahead. Okay, thank you so much. So, uh, thank you for inviting me to give a talk regarding retinopathy of prematurity as a brain marker, as a biomarker for brain development. As, as surely most of you know, the retina is part of the brain. And such, it is a strong biomarker for later development of preterm infants regarding visual development, but also cognitive development. As in pediatric ophthalmologist, there are most, in most countries, national guidelines on how to handle these infants regarding screening for retinopathy of prematurity. And in Sweden, we have a national patient registry for all patients screened for ROP since 2007. So what we see in about 75% of the babies is that the retinal vessels grow normally. And uh, we screen in Sweden all infants born below 30 weeks of gestation. We have changed these, uh, the over limit for screening babies during the last decade. But now we are down to below 30 weeks because we have not seen any baby developing severe ROP that are older than 29 plus six weeks. However, in about 30% of the babies, we see this. We see some kind of abnormal neurovascular development. And in some cases, we have to treat the infants because of neovascularizations to avoid retinal detachment and blindness. This is a baby with, with aggressive ROP with very central treatment with laser spots. Every spot here, yellow spot, is a laser treatment. And still, ROP is one of the most main causes for blindness in children. In Sweden, we looked at all the babies that had been treated for ROP and that became blind because we wanted to titrate out the reasons for blindness. And we found that in two thirds of the children that were blind, it was because of not following the guidelines. The babies had not been treated in time within the 72 hours that we, can ha that we have on us to treat the babies or the, the children were wrongly diagnosed or the treatment was not optimal. So this is how the natural history looks like in Sweden for ROP. And we have been able to take to, to have this map of ROP thanks to our now more than 11,000 babies screened for ROP in Sweden. And as you can see, we screen uh, the babies we screen 
approximately 70% never develop NRP and approximately 7% are treated. We have seen an increase in treated babies in Sweden and in other countries with a similar neonatal care. We do not see any changes in the incidence of ROP as the older babies now do better and do not develop so much ROP, but we have seen a survival of the most immature babies that are approximately 50% of babies now survive born less than 24 weeks. And 45% of those babies are treated for ROP. Thanks to our register, we have also been able to pinpoint the time with the highest risk of needing treatment for ROP. And we were quite surprised that it was more the postnatal age of the baby. As seen here, the highest risk for being treated is around 12 weeks after birth. And we can see that the risk starts to increase around week eight after birth. And of course, the younger the babies, there is a slight shift towards higher postnatal ages. But this is good, a good reminder. Now, for a long time, ROP was considered to be a vascular disease, but lately we know that it is a neurovascular disease, as we have found that it is the astrocyte precursors that actually produce the VGF that is that are responsible for the neovascularizations. And um, in this very nice experimental publication uh, about three years ago, it, the, the authors had managed to knock out the astrocytes possibility to produce VGF in the, the brain of the mice. And what they found was if the astrocyte could not produce VGF, there was a hypoplasia of the cerebral cortex. And, and the authors even stated that uh, the astrocytes in the brain work in the same manners as the astrocytes in the retina. So there are similar pathophysiology between brain development and retinal development. And that is not a surprise as retina, as I said, is part of the brain. We, we did see that there was a strong correlation between the stage of ROP, which is seen here on the x-axis, where we have children with no ROP, and on the y-axis we have the head circumference. And as you can see, the more severe ROP, the poorer is the head circumference. This is uh, at week 36, 36 postmenstrual age. And we could also see what was interesting following head circumference longitudinally, where we have um, the stage three and treated in the bottom here in blue, when we actually see that the, the growth of, of the brain is turned over regarding a head circumference standard deviation score, that is also the timing when we start to see the vessel growing on the retina. So for sure, they are following each other. It has also been shown that uh, the ROP developmental stage is correlated to uh, brain volume. In this case, it's uh, unmyelinized white matter volume where the children with no ROP have a higher score. And this is the cerebellar volume, also where children with, with no ROP has a higher score than children with any ROP. So uh, this is another study, uh, a similar study, but comparing severe ROP, children being treated for ROP in a different cohort in, in Holland. And here you can also see that the brain, brainstem volume is lower in children with severe ROP, as is the cerebellum volume. When it comes to function, it has also been shown that ROP stage is correlated to worse uh, motor and performance de developmental index. And in the large Elgin study, uh, they found that uh, infants with severe ROP were, were twice as likely to develop a low Bailey score below 70. And this was at two and a half years. 
we were very interested in, in studying a, a brain biomarker for uh, these preterm infants. And we looked at the biomarker, uh, brain injury biomarker, neurofilament light. And, and the line you see here is a reference value for adults. And it has been shown that adults, um, for instance, exposed to, to high, high risk of brain injury sports like hockey or boxing, or even going into space, uh, adults going into space were found to have levels above uh, 20. And, and quite surprisingly, our preterm babies had for four weeks uh, quite dramatically increased uh, levels of this brain injury biomarker. So then we were interested to see what this was correlated to. Was it correlated to any neonatal diagnosis like IVH, neck, poor nutrition? And the only variable that we could find was associated to this, these levels was actually ROP. And as you can see here, the levels in children with any ROP are significantly higher than the levels in children with no ROP. And, and this was true even after adjusting for gestational age, as we could also see that the younger babies had higher levels. Now, there is a, a quite a thorough research in Sweden ongoing looking at uh, autism in, in preterm babies and doing MRI in these babies. And, and in two of these studies, I was quite intrigued to look at the neonatal variables uh, in children with autism that were matched in gestational age and weight to uh, children with no autism. And looking at all their neonatal characteristics, actually uh, one of the things that came strongest out was actually the, the ROP, any ROP as well as treated ROP. So um, there is uh, seem to be a, a correlation with especially neuropsychiatric diagnosis and ROP. So this, made us in, in Gothenburg look at our data. And we had actually 27% of the babies with autism. And then we looked at uh, the risk uh, having severe ROP and actually 7, 67% of the children with severe ROP also had autism and any ROP, it was 89%. And then we looked at IVH. And as you can see, it's a much lower correlation between a neuropsychiatric diagnosis and IVH in this cohort. Uh, we recently looked at all babies born below 24 weeks in Sweden in a project called TINY. Uh, and uh, about 22% uh, of those babies were visually impaired. And in fact, all of those babies, which was 72, had other diagnosis related to the brain. 64% of these babies with visual impairment were treated for ROP, but about a third had other cerebral reasons for their, their severe visual impairment. And here you can see the, the other uh, diagnosis related to the brain in this cohort of extremely, extremely preterm babies born below 24 weeks of gestation. Uh, actually, 75% um, of the babies had diagnosis related to the brain in this cohort. So what is it? What, what is the, the, the big risk of, of these babies uh, having severe ROP with later poorer cognitive outcome? Well, uh, is it the disease itself that what we see in the retina when we see these bad neovascularizations that that also is a marker of, of poor brain development? Or is it uh, what we do when we give these babies laser and, and in, when we have they, their general anesthesia? So a very nice study looking at general anesthesia in children with not so severe ROP, actually pre-threshold ROP, did not 
see that the children who had had surgery or anesthesia actually performed worse regarding psychomotor development at least. So in this study, there is no evidence that it is the, the procedure that is causing the poorer outcome, but rather the disease itself that reflects then a poor brain development. When it comes to risk factors that would likely affect both the, the retinal development as well as the brain development is the yeah. oxygen exposure. And um, we managed to look at um, almost or a little bit more than 1,900 babies and 27,000 data points and found that in the babies that developed severe disease, it was actually the, the high variability in oxygen exposure, not that they were exposed to, not that the babies had very high oxygenation, they rather had low oxygenation, but they had a high variability. And this has also been shown by others that it is rather the high variation in oxygen delivery that is associated with, with uh, poor uh, neurovascularization at least when it is somewhat controlled. Um, it has also been shown in experimental studies in mice that exposing the, the animals for uh, hyper hypooxygenia actually decreases the myelin basic protein and upregulate the <clears throat> glial fibrialic acid protein, which is a marker of, of brain injury. So it seems that fluctuations is not good for brain or as well as retinal development. Another factor that we know affects both the retina and the brain is actually anemia. In many, many publications, it is stated that it is transfusions that is a risk factor for ROP. But in fact, it is the reasons for transfusions, the anemia, it seems as especially during the first weeks after birth. And um, there are studies on delayed core clamping in, in regarding the risk for uh, abnormal development. And um, it seems as by uh, delayed core clamping, uh, it seems as uh, there is a less risk for poorer development later in life. We also looked at this and, and uh, regarding uh, one important factor for oxygen delivery actually, and that is the fetal hemoglobin levels. And as you know, the, in intrauterinely, the, the babies are mostly exposed to fetal hemoglobin. And after birth in a, in a term baby, it takes approximately two months to reduce the levels to around uh, 20%. But in our preterm babies, the levels are quite rapidly reduced. This is only the first week after life. And you can see the, the quicker the, the reduction in fetal hemoglobin and the higher the decrease, the higher the risk for any ROP. This is also true for BPD. Um, and uh, looking at fetal hemoglobin and the brain, it has been shown that cerebral oxygenation transport is lower if the fetal hemoglobin levels go below 30%. And uh, as you can see in, in this image, after a week, we are really below 30% uh, in, in the majority of the preterm babies. So uh, it seems as uh, exchanging uh, fetal hemoglobin with adult hemoglobin, as we do when the babies are exposed to iatrogenic phlebotomy due to clinical sampling. And this is a cohort from Sweden where we found that during the first two weeks of life, 57% of the blood volume was lost due to clinical sampling. And of course, the more blood uh, we take from the babies, the more blood we give. And what we give is not fetal blood, but it is adult blood and adult erythrocytes with a completely different affinity to oxygen. 
And uh, of course, it is also other factors that we exchange when we do the, uh, take the sampling of the babies. So uh, restrictive blood sampling is, is highly recommended. It's also interesting to note that uh, it is really a relation between uh, what type, if it is a male or a female donor regarding, in this case, the, the red blood cells. So it seems as a female donor is to prefer regarding uh, neck, death, BPD, and a composite outcome. Actually, the only uh, neonatal diagnosis that was not um, affected by uh, the sex of the donor was ROP. It's also interesting to note that when plasma is given, it is always plasma from men because of the risk of giving female plasma or the host versus graft reaction. So um, I think in most countries, at least in Sweden and in Europe, we only give plasma from men. So to also to the preterm babies. Uh, now looking at uh, proteins that are related to ROP uh, in a large cohort of extremely preterm babies born below 28 weeks, we found that of 550 proteins, 20 were related to gestational age and or ROP. And they were within the functional areas, hematopoiesis, angiogenesis, CNS development, and immune function. So this really shows that um, brain and retina goes hand in hand regarding development and that they are tightly associated. But also it shows the importance of, of the blood components for this development. So how can we do uh, to reduce this, this iatrogenic phlebotomy? Well, of course, uh, delayed cord clamping has become a big thing all over the world uh, because of its positive e effects. And of course, reduction in, in blood sampling. There is a large national uh, multi-center study ongoing in Sweden, which is called Less is More, where we use micro methods to look at blood gases and infection variables like CRP. And by that, reducing the vo blood volume uh, phlebotomy by 50%. But we have also lately looked into if uh, <clears throat> it would be possible to use cord blood transfusions in a study called NeoRed, where we now have a product with fetal uh, erythrocytes that uh, can be infused instead of adult erythrocytes. And uh, we'll later see how that will, outcome will go. So another factor important for development is the um, uh, and uh, the growth factor, insulin-like growth factor one, IGF one. And after birth, the levels of IGF one is uh, quite dramatically reduced. The red dots here are are blood samples from preterm infants and their levels compared to the intrauterine levels at the corresponding gestational age. And we found that in babies with uh, poor um, uh, neurovascular development, they had significantly lower levels of, of, these, uh, of this growth factor compared to children with normal development. And uh, then it was hypothesized that maybe if these levels could be restored, we could also normalize uh, development in the in the uh, and the retina and the brain and hopefully the lungs, and that was uh, the background for a multi center study that is now ongoing, and in the first uh, phase two study. Uh, it showed positive effects, not so much on the retina, but especially on the lungs and also in reducing IVH. So um, this uh, study has, uh, is now ongoing again, and the first publication was out now three years ago. 
This is a, a sub-study where we looked at the levels of IGF-1 and related it to brain volumes in um, approximately, I think this was a bit over 60 babies that were born extremely preterm. And this was actually accepted last week in pediatric research. And you can see that there are some um, some brain volumes that for sure were correlated to IGF-1 or during the first postnatal month, also when correcting for gestational age. And that is again the cerebellar, the cortical gray matter, white matter, and total brain volume, as well as the deep gray matter volume. So um, maybe, maybe IGF-1 uh, could be uh, interesting, uh, interesting uh, hormone to substitute these babies with, but I think the ongoing trial will will tell us more about this. Um, another factor that is important for the development of preterm babies are the fatty acids. And during the third trimester, uh, omega six arachidonic acid is transported actively from the mother to the fetus, as well as DHA, the omega-3, especially during the last part of the third trimester. But after preterm birth, we know that the levels of these uh, factors drastically are uh, reduced. And we have also seen that in babies with ROP, they reduce more as compared to in babies with no signs of ROP. And this is uh, the omega-6 arachidonic acid, and this is DHA. So um, we were interested in, in um, actually looking at brain volumes in relation to these fatty acids and found that um, uh, higher DHA levels were associated with a higher total brain volume and higher arachidonic acid levels were associated with decreased ventricular size volumes. So this all encouraged us to actually perform a trial where we wanted to uh, substitute the babies with arachidonic acid and DHA two to one enterally as there is no parenteral solution with both these components. And we gave a small amount uh, from birth to 40 weeks gestation. At birth, we gave say 0.1 mil and around 40 weeks, we gave approximately one milliliter. Uh, and point was ROP. And this is the outcome regarding the fatty acid levels it could act and arachidonic acid see that we had a profound effect on severe R and the, the um, solid line here are the children with substitute if they end up with the same positive outcome regarding ROP. So there are studies that have shown positive outcomes for the brain uh, administering uh, DHA. And uh, this, uh, this is a study looking at different IVH stages. And here you have the percentage of the DHA. And as you can see, the less uh, grade of uh, the, the higher the grade of IVH, the lower the DHA. And there are also some studies that have showed uh, better uh, microstructural development as well as functional development after early DHA to preterm infants. Um, interestingly, we have shown that in children with a high parenteral lipid intake. We actually 
whoops, this didn't work. Uh, we actually found that the higher the parenteral lipid intake was, the lower was the both DHA levels and arachidonic acid levels. And as you can see here, uh, quite surprisingly, we found that the higher the intake uh, of parental lipids, the lower was the head circumference score. And this was also associated to lower levels of, of the fatty acid, both omega-6 and omega-3 that I mentioned. Excuse me, ma'am. Yes. Uh, we are running out of time. Can you please uh, wind it up within five minutes? Yeah, this is the last slide. So ROP development is associated with abnormal brain development. We know that it is associated, uh, we know that it shares histopathological mechanisms. We know that they share uh, similar risk factors, and I believe they are likely to benefit from similar preventative actions. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, madam. It was quite an enlightening talk. You covered so many aspects about the prevention of ROP. And if in future, if we're able to prevent ROP, we can prevent neurological handicaps of these tiny preterm babies also. Thanks a lot. Any questions from audience? I'd like to ask only one question, madam. Right now, there is anti-VEGF coming up. And uh, there is always overlap between laser therapy and anti-VEGF treatment in treatment of ROP. So did you find any difference in neurological development in those babies who are treated by anti-VEGF and those who are treated by laser? Actually, this is a very tricky question. And unfortunately, there are no good prospective studies looking at this. And in Sweden, we have very few babies um, treated with only anti-VGF or laser. We, we use this treatment with anti-VGF only for the most severe cases, the zone one disease. Um, and um, then it normally they also need a laser treatment. So it's difficult to, to split it from each other, but it might be, and I'm not sure of this. I think the future will reveal that, but it might be that the two different treatments are associated with different uh, neurological outcomes. Uh, it might be that um, one is more associated with a neuropsychiatric diagnosis and one is more associated with a neurocognitive outcome. And if I was to choose which one would go one direction, I would say, uh, maybe that the inflammation we cause with laser would postpone more for neuropsychiatric diagnosis, and maybe anti-VGF could affect uh, cognitive development in a different manner. But this is only a speculation. Um, as for now, there are some reports pointing at uh, that anti-VGF has some poorer outcomes, but it's difficult since also these babies are the most severely uh, affected, but there are also several studies now that cannot show any, any negative effects of anti-VGF. So, so I don't think we have the, the true an answer today. Thank you very much. Can I ask Thanks. just one, one question? Me. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Please, I, please. Uh, do you think uh, the time has come to give DHA supplements to all preterm babies? Uh, I, I, I don't think only DHA. I don't think that is good. I think for sure, if you give DHA, I think you should give arachidonic acid also, uh, because we saw yes. that a certain degree of arachidonic acid is actually needed for DHA to, to have a maximum effect. And if we only give DHA, it could be also negative, as was seen in the big study with Collins with the risk for BPD. Um, and I, I, I would really like to see the, the outcome of the study from Norway, uh, because, uh, you know, always doing one study can give one finding, but if we have two studies going in the same direction, I would feel much, much more confident to, to recommend it. But we could not see any negative effects on, the, on this uh, substitution. So... Um, it's difficult uh, to, to give you a, a answer yes or no, 
but um, if if I had a baby born or my child children would have a baby born this week, I would definitely recommend it. Thank you, madam. Thanks a lot. Thank you for your patient listening. More to organizers. Thank you. Thank you.